we begin our unit on thermodynamics by considering temperature, heat, and thermal expansion. And really, what we're going to do today is a review of many concepts that were first presented in our grade 11 physics course. Um, we're going to look at them again today, but add a little bit more meat to that initial introduction. Thermal physics is, of course, a branch in science that investigates the conversion of thermal energy into mechanical energy. Um, we're going to look at a lot in the next four lessons. We're going to look at the concept of heat and its application in various scenarios like engines and so on and so forth. So to begin, we talk about the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Of course, there's the first and second law, which we'll learn later. But we talk first about the zeroth law. And temperature is actually a very difficult concept to describe. Okay, because our definition of what hot and cold are are very closely related with how our body senses the flow of heat. So if you right now at this point remove your socks and you were, say, asked to compare the temperature of, of say, the ceramic tiles in your kitchen to the temperatures of the carpet in the next adjacent room, say the living room, you would likely state that the tiles feel colder than the carpet. And that isn't true. Both the tiles and the carpet have been in the same room or in the same vicinity of the house for quite some time, and the house is at more or less the same temperature. But your body doesn't sense temperature. Your body senses the flow of heat from your feet to the different materials. And of course, tiles will take heat from your body faster than the carpet will. And so that's why you feel a little bit colder. And because of this difficulty in the description of temperature, scientists created this concept of thermal equilibrium. And two objects are said to be in thermal equilibrium if no heat or no change in temperature results when the objects are brought into contact. And that's defined by the zeroth law of thermodynamics, which states that if two objects are in thermal equilibrium with some third object, then the two objects themselves are in thermal equilibrium with each other. <clears throat> and this may seem like a very straightforward concept, but it's not because the way that our bodies perceive heat is very subjective and it indicates that, okay, this concept maybe isn't that straightforward. However, the thermometer is a precise it, um, is, is a precise application of the zeroth law of thermodynamics. And the way that a thermometer works is that the, the thermometer will um, accept heat flow from whatever substance to itself, and it will tell you through calibration, through a calibrated scale, the temperature. And of course, we all know that the thermometer will move when heat is flowing into it and will eventually come to rest at some point. And the point at which it comes to rest is the point at which, of course, no more heat's flowing. And then it can tell you the temperature of whatever you put the thermometer in. <clears throat> so the thermometer really measures thermal equilibrium. And it is a test object that's brought into contact with some substance. And after a time, once thermal, thermal equilibrium is achieved, heat no longer flows and the temperature of the subject substance can be determined. And of course, we've talked in grade 11 about the Fahrenheit scale, the Celsius scale, and the Kelvin scale. And for the most part, the Celsius, Kelvin, and, Cel and Kelvin scales are, are what you see in use around the world. <clears throat> the Kelvin degree scale is the same size as the uh, Celsius degree, so one degree Celsius is the same size as one degree Kelvin. Um, but the Kelvin scale, of course, starts at zero, and there are no negative degrees Kelvin. Zero Kelvin is called absolute zero, and that indicates the temperature at which all molecular motion stops.
to talk about heat, we talk about hot things cooling down and cold things warming up. And we're all very familiar with that. If you put a hot mug of coffee out on the table, after a while it will get cold. And we can rephrase that subject by saying that, okay, well, hot things then lose something and cold things gain something. And for a long time, scientists really thought that the something that they gained was a special type of fluid, and they called it caloric fluid. And so they used the term calorie to track um, the fluid, and they defined it as the amount of this special fluid needed to gain um, the temperature to change the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. And recently, though, it's been determined that temperature is actually correlated with the amount of energy that exists. So instead of being the flow of this special fluid called caloric fluid, it's actually the flow of heat or the flow of energy. And so the energy inside of a substance is known as internal energy. And we're going to discuss internal energy as we progress through this unit. But there's something that exists here where really temperature is very closely correlated with the motion of atoms and molecules that are in a substance. And the more motion of atoms and molecules you have, the greater the temperature. And the less motion you have, the lower the temperature all the way down to the point at which you have no motion at all and you have absolute zero. Simply put though, when an object cools down, it's losing some of that internal energy. Its molecules are getting slower. <clears throat> and this is very similar in fact, in principle, this is very similar to the way that energy is transferred um, in and out of a system through work. Okay, So you do work on an object, you insert energy into the object, and the, ener the object it has more energy, whether that's potential energy or whether it's kinetic energy. So in thermal physics, if you transfer heat, right, if you do work on something, and that's called heat transfer, so if you do, if you transfer heat to something, then the energy of that object then goes up, and so it gains heat. So we call work heat transfer, and the energy that's transferred we call heat. And of course heat is a form of energy, and it has proper units of joules. And the way that we relate that kind of outdated model of heat as a fluid to heat as energy is called the mechanical equivalent of heat. And basically it states that one calorie is equal to 4.186 joules. Now, of course, we've heard calorie very often. If you look at any nutrition label in Canada, you'll see that food is rated with calories. Those calories actually begin, however, with a capital C. And one calorie, when we're talking about food, is actually one kilocalorie um, uh, in the old manner of speaking. So that's just something to note, that one calorie um, with a capital C is actually a thousand, is actually a thousand calories um, when we're talking about heat as a fluid, okay? <clears throat> so here's an example. If you eat a 2,000 calorie dinner, capital C, how many times would you need to lift a 50 kilogram barbell to burn off this much energy? Well, we've got our energy input which is about 2,000 calories. And of course, if we want to turn this eventually into joules, we need to turn that into lowercase calories, so 2,000 times 10 to the third. And we're going to multiply that, of course, by 4.186 joules per calorie. So we actually have a substantial amount of, um, amount of energy here, and that's 8.372 times 10 to the six joules. 8 million, almost 8.5 million joules. And of course the mass of our barbell is 50 kilograms and because my arm span is about, um, my arm length I would say is about 0 0.75 meters, that would be about how high I would lift that barbell every single time. For you it might be different. 
And so here we go. Basically, what we're doing, because we're lifting this barbell, is we're lifting it against gravity, and we're going to do it a certain number of times, n times. So we're going to perform the same repetition n times, and of course the energy of each repetition is just mgh. So we can sub in our values, and what we get if we rearrange and solve for n is about 22,780 repetitions you would have to perform to burn off this many calories, which is a lot. That's, that's, that's a lot of repetitions. Now, of course, why don't we have to do this? You know, if we eat a 2,000 calorie dinner, we don't have to perform this much, and it's basically because to do everything that our body does, it needs energy. Of course, we're burning a lot of energy just as you sit here and watch this presentation. <clears throat> so it's strict. It's not strictly just one-to-one, -one, where if you put this much energy in, you got to burn that much energy off in the gym. Your body's constantly burning energy. You even burn energy when you sleep which is great. So let's talk now about heat transfer. And we want to remember that basically the amount of heat energy transferred to a certain substance depends on three things. And you may remember these. The mass of the substance is really important. So the, the more massive something is, um, the more heat energy can be transferred to it. The change in temperature so if I have something at a very low temperature and I want to take it to a very, very high temperature, I'm going to require more heat energy transferred to that object. And of course, the specific heat capacity of that object. Some things very readily accept heat. Some things are more resistant. And so the amount of heat that flows is based on the above quantities, and it's given by an equation. And in our notation, we use delta EH. So for almost all types of energy in our courses, we've used delta E, and then we've given a subscript. And so here we've got heat energy, so we use E sub H, and it's equal to MC delta T. Heat flow, though, and you should get used to seeing different notations, heat flow is sometimes called Q, okay? And so you'll often see Q is equal to MC delta T, um, depending on what notation you use. And so in a closed system, we can use the conservation of energy. So if we close our system off from the environment, we can determine how much heat would flow from one object to another, noting that the gain in heat energy of one substance has to equal the loss in heat energy of the other substance. And so we would do this in a calorimeter, and we would isolate two substances from their surroundings, and that's what calorimeters do, and they're great. We've done labs on those. And what we find, of course, is the conservation of heat energy, which says, hey, if you put something in a calorimeter for the most part, the heat energy that's gained by one is going to equal negative the heat energy that's lost by the other. So let's take a look at an example of this. A hard-boiled egg has a heat capacity of 2.4 times 10 to the third joules per kilogram degree Celsius. It has a mass of 50 grams. It's cooled from 100 degrees Celsius, so it was in boiling water, we want to eat it right away. We don't have time to just let it sit in the air, so we're going to plunk it in cold water. In one liter of cold water at 5 degrees Celsius, and we're going to cool it down. What will the final temperature of the water and the egg be after they've been allowed to sit for a few moments? So here's what we know about the egg. We've got our information here. We're trying to find T2. Here's what we know about the water. We've got our information. We want to find T2. Again, because T2 is going to be similar, excuse me, the same for both. They're both sitting together. And so now we introduce the conservation of energy. And we say that the heat that's gained by the egg, excuse me, the heat that's lost by the egg, is going to equal the heat that's gained by the water. We take our MC delta T formulas for each, and we sub in our numbers. And of course, what we find is that that negative sign is very, very important. If we didn't do that, we'd get a wrong answer for T. Negative sign is very important. And after we do some algebra, we find that 
the temperature of the egg and the water sitting together is 7.6 degrees Celsius. So the temperature of the egg has come down quite a bit, and the temperature of the water has gone up just a little bit. So here's a question. Why is the value for final temperature so much closer to the initial temperature of the water than the initial temperature of the egg? How come that egg didn't shoot the water up much more than just 2.6 degrees? And of course the answer is, well, look at how much egg there was, and look at how much water there was. There's a lot more water to accept heat, and so it's going to be a little bit more resistant to change. And if you think about that on a molecular basis, the egg's really, really hot. And so its molecules are bouncing around a lot. Tiny, but you know they're, the mole molecular motion is quite a bit greater in the water, in the egg, than in the water. When you plunk that egg in there, some of that molecular motion gets transferred to the, to the water. But of course, there's so much water in comparison to the egg. And so, eh, the temperature of the water goes up a little bit. Heat conduction is, of course, one method of heat transfer. There's heat conduction. There's also convection. And there's radiation. And that's how heat is transferred. You know that. That's a review. But conduction we can actually define. Conduction is based on four things. The first is the temperature difference between the end of an object. So if, if I've got um, a substance that's one temperature at one end and another temperature at the other end, heat will flow through that object, and that's what conduction is. So the temperature difference between the ends, it varies directly on that. It also varies directly on the cross-sectional area that heat flows through. Okay, so a larger cross-sectional area, more conduction, more heat transfer. The thermal conductivity of the substance, and again, thermal conductivity is a property of the material. Here it has the letter K. It's similar to heat, specific heat capacity. It's measured in joule per meter second degree Celsius, which is actually... Uh, watts per meter degree Celsius. Substances with a very high conductivity conduct heat well. Substances with a low conductivity are very good insulators. And the fourth thing that it depends on is the distance, of course, between the two ends. But it, here it depends indirectly on that. And so if we take these four concepts and we put them together, we can define H, which is our heat transfer rate. So now it's important to note that H is actually the amount of heat energy that's transferred per unit time. Okay, so it's a rate, it's, it's heat that's transferred in a certain amount of time, and we get uh, conductivity times the area times the change in temperature divided by the length or the distance between the two ends. And again, we can do an example with this. So here we have two slabs. They have a similar and a, a the same cross-sectional area, okay? but they have different thicknesses. So one of the thicknesses is one centimeter, and the other thickness is two centimeters. They have two different thermal conductivities. One is 238 watts per meter degree Celsius, and the other is 397 watts per meter degree Celsius. They're in thermal contact with each other, and they are at thermal equilibrium. So the boundary between them now is at a constant temperature. So no more heat is flowing between them. They're in thermal equilibrium. If the outer surface of slab 1, which is indicated by T1 in the diagram, is at 400 degrees Celsius, and the outer surface of slab 2 is at 600 degrees Celsius, what is the temperature at the interface? And of course, here's what we know, and it's a long list of things. We've got L1, L2, K1, K2. We know we don't know what the cross-sectional areas are, but we know that they're the same, or we're going to assume at least that they're the same. We know T1, we know T2, and we're trying to find T. And so what we can say is, all right, well, here's the rate of heat transfer for 1, and here's the rate of heat transfer for slab 2. But we know that because they're in thermal equilibrium, and I'm telling you that they are, so we're just assuming that, H1 
is equal to H2. So the amount of heat that's flowing into one is the same as the amount of heat that's flowing into the other in a given amount of time. And so, hey, we can equate these two things together. And we can take all the ones on one side and set them up to all the twos on the other side. Now, be very careful how I have arranged temperature. Okay, For slab one, the temperature of the interface is larger than T1. So I've got T minus 400. But for slab two, the temperature at the interface will, of course, be lower. So I've got 600 minus T. Because I don't want to introduce a negative sign here. That'll screw us up. And what we can do is we can rearrange, and we can get rid of some of these fractions, and we can simplify and remove these brackets. And when we rearrange and simplify, this is what we end up with. We end up with an expression for temperature and an answer of 491 degrees Celsius. So exactly what it should be. T1 is 400, T2 is 600. We'd expect the temperature at the interface to be lower than slab 1, but excuse me, higher than slab 1, but lower than slab 2. And so there it is. So the temperature at the interface, 491. And that's a, con that's a conduction question, a very typical conduction question. The last thing that we want to look at, which we really didn't look at at all in grade 11, is thermal expansion. And as you've experienced, most substances will change their size when subjected to a change in temperature. Okay, this is, in fact, how some thermometers work. Um, you know, what happens in a mercury thermometer or an alcohol thermometer is that you plunk it into something that's warm, and, of course, the size of the fluid that's in there changes and it, it rises up the, up the tube. So for most objects, an increase in temperature translates to an increase in size. So if the temperature goes up, the size of the object increases. A decrease in temperature translates to a decrease in size. This observable characteristic can be explained basically by understanding that temperature is a measure of substance's internal energy. So if you think about a long, thin rod, okay, it's much longer than it is wide. When it experiences an increase in temperature, the molecules in the rod have increased their kinetic energy. So molecule motion goes up. The motion of the particles has increased. And that increase in motion requires more room, and so the, exp the rod expands its length. And this increase in length is proportional to the change in temperature and the original length of the rod. Okay, so that's what it's proportional to. The constant of proportionality that's introduced is called the coefficient of linear expansion. And again, just like the other two things, um, specific heat capacity and thermal conductivity, coefficient of linear expansion is a property of the substance. It has units of K to the negative 1 or degrees Celsius to the negative 1. And here's our equation for the length of an expanding um, object in one dimension. We can also include a discussion of thermal expansion in two and three dimensions. Okay, so basically now, instead of just saying, okay, it's only going to expand in one dimension, we can say, well, it could expand in two dimensions. It could also expand in three dimensions. So we don't talk about length anymore. We talk about area and volume. And we have this new coefficient of area expansion and a coefficient of volume expansion, which is gamma and beta. And basically, a good approximation is that gamma is equal to 2 alpha and beta was equal to 3 alpha. So here's a quick little example. A metal bar has a coefficient of linear expansion of 5 times 10 to the minus 6 degrees Celsius to the negative 1. If the bar is originally one meter long at 20 degrees Celsius, how much longer is it when we've raised the temperature to 120 degrees Celsius? Well, here's what we know. And here's the equation that governs thermal expansion in one dimension. We can sub in our numbers. And what we get is something very small. But when we convert that, we say, oh, Okay, if it was one meter long and we're increasing the temperature of it by 100 degrees, it's actually growing by about a half a millimeter, which isn't very much, but that's substantial, especially if you're talking about 
um, engineering or you have certain clearances that have to fit. This is often one of the reasons why in the summer metal doors will stick because the temperature is a little bit bigger and the metal has increased by a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction um, and it becomes a little bit more sticky. And so there you have it. That's the introduction to thermodynamics.